Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We're starting a new series of Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. This series is entitled The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant, and we're going to start out with what happened? Lesson number one for April 3 of 2021. And as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for all you've done to try to bring correction to all that happened, has happened here on this world. We think back to the days of Adam and Eve and how sad it was that they were deceived and misled now, Lord, help us to understand how, what you have done and how you plan to make it right again. May we come to be more like you as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What an incredible beginning. Just think about it. That garden and Adam and Eve there. A Adam was probably somewhere around 15 feet tall, and e Eve was probably 12 or 13 feet tall. Man. And the animals around, you could pet the lions and all that kind of stuff. And every day after he created something new, God says it's good, and then finally that last day, you know, when after creating man and the animals, he said it's very good. And if God says it's very good, there's a pretty good chance that it is. <laughs> That's the only time that very is used during creation. Yeah. Huh? Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, there were none of the problems that we know about today, the devastations, the typhoons, the earthquakes, the famines, the pandemics, none of the major diseases that we've, we know about. So what happened? Well, God created human beings in his own image. They must have been perfect. I mean, if they're made in God's image, wouldn't that have to be perfect? None of the sinful characteristics that we know about today were there. No murderers, thieves, liars, swindlers, any other kind of sinful group. But unfortunately, Adam and Eve sinned. And thus, sin plunged our world into and under the control of Satan. So what would God do next? Believe it or not, he instituted the plan of salvation. Many people have strange ideas about the origins of man. Even modern scientists think that they have explanations for how this world was created and how life was created on this earth without God. One famous chemical engineer, one of the most decorated chemical engineers in the entire world, has explored the possibility of creating the chemicals that made that might have been necessary to create the very first cell that uh, that might uh, that w was well, if it had been such a thing. And he said, these people who are speculating on how that could have happened under a rock somewhere, they are simply clueless. They have not even tried to make these cells and, th and these chemical things that would have put the could have put together to make to make a cell a living cell. Well, philosophers down through the generations have puzzled over four existential questions. What's an existential question? Something that has to do with existence. The very, our very existence, that's correct. About origin, meaning, yeah, purpose, and destiny. Origin, meaning, purpose, and destiny. One, where did we come from? Two, why are we here? Three, what is the greatest good possible in life, and where do we go after we die? These have been questions that people have speculated about and philosophers have argued about probably since shortly after the days of Adam and Eve. Um, and there are a lot of verses in the Bible that are pretty clear. Genesis 1, 1, Psalm 100, verse 3, Isaiah 40, verse 28, Acts 17, verse 26, Ephesians 3, 9, and Hebrews 1, 2, and 10, and, and we could go on and on and on. It's very clear that God just said, I did it. They, through Jesus Christ, he created the world that we know today. Well, the world that, the perfect world that was there in the beginning. God did not try to explain philosophically or in any other way how or why he did it. He simply did it. Now, we must accept that. And here's something that immediately, as soon as I start explaining, there's going to be people with different opinions here. 
we must accept it on the basis of the evidence that is available to us. Well, what evidence is there? The very existence of life here on this earth. No other being or, 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 or plan or group of people have created a single living thing without following what God made in the beginning. None of us were there to see the beginning, and only God has given us account of what actually happened. So that makes it sort of a one-sided argument, isn't it? No matter what your ideas about origins might be, maybe you're an evolutionist, creationist or evolutionist. Since one cannot recreate the event, one must accept one's ideas by faith. You, you can't prove it, although we're going to give some pretty powerful evidence coming up here. Well, as we know, Satan had claimed that he should be treated as an equal, on an equality with Christ in the heavenly kingdom. He was jealous and envious, and thus created that rebellion which caused one-third of the angels to be cast out. So what do we know about the history of Satan immediately after his fall? We have some very interesting words from Ellen White. Jim, would you be willing to share those with us? Satan trembled as he viewed his work. He was alone in mediation, excuse me, Med in meditation upon the past, the present, and his future plans. His mighty frame shook as with a tempest. An angel from heaven was passing. He called him and entreated an interview with Christ. This was granted to him. He then related to the Son of God that he repented of his rebellion and wished to enter the favor of God. He was willing to take the place God had previously signed him and, he, and be under his wise command. Christ wept at Satan's woe, but told him as the mind of God that he could never be received into heaven. Heaven must not be a place in, excuse me, must not be placed in jeopardy. All heaven would be marred should he be received back for the sin and rebellion originated with him and the seeds of rebellion were still within him. He had, in his, he had in his rebellion no occasion for his course, and he had not only hopelessly ruined himself, but the host of angels also, who would then have been happy in heaven had he remained steadfast. The law of God could not, excuse me, the law of God could condemn, but could not pardon. He repented, not of his rebellion, because he saw the goodness of God, which he had abused. It was not possible that his love for God had so increased since his fall that he would lead to cheerful submission and happy obedience to his law, excuse me, to his law, which had been despised. And wretchedness he realized in losing the sweep, the sweet light of heaven and the sense of guilt, which forced him Self upon him, forced itself upon him, and the disappointment he experienced, him not finding his expectations realized, were the cause of his grief. To be commander out of heaven was vastly different from being thus honored in heaven. The loss he had sustained of all the privileges of heaven seemed too much to be borne. He wished to regain these. This great change of position had not increased his love for God, nor for his wise and just law. When Satan became fully convinced that there was no possibility of his being reinstated in the, fa in the favor of God, he manifested his malice with increased hatred and fiery vehemence. Let me interrupt for a second. So this is proof of what we read up there earlier. Right. You know, he, Christ interviewed him and he said, no, the seeds of rebellion are still there. And when finally he says, oh no, there's really no chance for us to take you back, Satan was, Rah. you know, he was just vehement hatred. Go ahead. God knew that such a determined rebellion would not remain ac inactive. Satan would invent means to annoy the heavenly angels and show contempt for his authority. He could not... Re As he, he could. As he could not gain admission within the gates of heaven, he would wait just at the entrance to taunt the angels and seek contention with them as they went in and out. He would seek to destroy the happiness of Adam and Eve. He would endeavor to incite them to rebellion, knowing that this would cause grief 
in heaven. So he was determined to do anything he could to get back at God. Yeah. Well, he figured if he couldn't have it, he was going to destroy everything. Yeah. And, uh, kind of like a temper tantrum, right? Yeah. His followers were seeking him, and he, that is Satan, aroused himself and assuming a good a look of defiance, informed them of his plans to wrest from God the noble Adam and his companion Eve. And if they could gain access to the tree of life in the midst of the garden, their strength would, they thought, be equal to that of the holy angels, and even God himself could not expel them. Wow. Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 29. Wow, what a story. And the insight that, that Ellen White had so early on, we're talking, what, and, over 150 years yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. And who, who's got that? Uh, and this was very early on in her, yeah, in her ministry. She didn't have a lot of helpers at this no, time. No, she didn't. Yeah, it's amazing stuff, just amazing stuff. And, two, go ahead. Two quick things, very quickly, I think you could handle this. Um, Satan did present himself when the sons of God came together, and we read it in Job. Yeah. So, you know, just God to, invited him. God allowed him to come. Right. So he was allowed to go back. Yes. Uh, to speak. Well, now, and, and, you know, I have differences of opinion in my mind about that, because remember, God is omnipresent. Right. So we can pray to God. We, we, think of, we think of our praying as if we're praying to God somewhere far away. No, we're praying to God right here. That is true. He, he is right here. So Satan didn't have to go anywhere to address God. God is right here. Wherever Satan goes, God is there. But, but the sons yeah. of God. Yeah, I, I, so, I follow you. Right. We don't know where they gathered or whether God just allowed, I mean, just reproduced Satan's words for their benefit. Um, what anyway, we, what we can do with the Zoom thing nowadays? It, yeah. What ha, yeah, is available I mean, for eternity yeah. uh, past is. Hey, uh, it just comes to mind, you know. So yeah, in this Zoom that we're doing, you know, uh, it's unbelievable for all. Uh, and and yeah. this is child's play compared really, to what the really, infant exactly. Yeah. Is, yeah. Good point, family good point. Had. And it was all done to educate yes. the on the, the the what we call the angelic beings, or that yeah. we refer to her the uh, the third of the angels that were that left. Heaven fell from heaven. Remember the stories what yeah. Genesis or Revelation, Revelation twelve four 12. the yeah. dragon's tail swept down. Right, right. Okay, it wasn't that God threw him out? No, it was they, they chose to go. Yeah. But the, the way we've learned it is those that hung around the other two thirds still had questions in their mind that had to be answered. We're, we're going to talk about those. So, but the other one very quickly as well. Um, even growing up as a kid, uh, I was told uh, that Satan had a chance to repent until the cross. Yeah, probably true. Probably true. But probably. you can see he but was... He could never go back to his original place. <clears throat> no. Well, was he... Was he uh, he's not kept out. He just chose, he didn't want to be there. He didn't live in that environment for well, the rest of eternity either. I would say at this point in time, the other beings in the universe don't want to have anything to do with no. him. No. But there was a simple event that took, I shouldn't call it a simple event, an incredible event that took place about 2,000 years ago that fully and completely eliminated Satan from being considered equal with Christ. And here's the quotation from Desire of Ages that proves that. When the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb saying, the Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in him. Now was proven the truth of his words. I laid down my life that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and the rulers, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. John chapter 10 verse 17 this is from Ellen White's Desire of Ages. That, and that's an example of where Jesus says, you aren't even to get the satisfaction of killing me. Yeah. I get to lay my down life down and I'm going to take it up again. And I think this is appropriate for you to explain to, to uh, the folk around the world who are listening. Some folk will say, well, Christ was not in the tomb for three days and three nights. Well, I mean, 
Yeah, you in, in ancient times, in ancient times, they had two ways of counting time. And what we're talking about here is many nations counted time, even a small part of a day was counted as a day. So a small part of Friday, the full day of Sabbath, and a part of Sunday. And that, in that mind, that was three days. Very well, right. Very, very Thank simple. You. I want you to, to mention, this, these are my words, and then we're going to go back to Ellen White again. Satan knows perfectly well that he could never do what Jesus did on that occasion. If he's dead, it's all over for him. He is a creature. He is not a creator. There's no way he has the power of life within himself. Thus, we believe that God has provided all the evidence we need to tell us that Jesus is not on the same plane with Satan. I, th I, I cannot help it, but just to add this much, I'm going to be walking with a brilliant uh, Christian tomorrow mm -hmm. morning, okay? And, uh, but I think he represents the rest of the Christendom, except for Adventists. Uh, they believe that there's eternal death, means eternal life in hell. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you know, it's only that some Adventists, so. Well, it brings to mind Hebrews, was it Hebrews 4? who through fear of death has been in lifelong bondage. Yeah. What about the, uh, Satan? He was afraid to die. Yeah. And I've, I've gotten so close to death uh, that at least there's a portion of my life I don't remember that when I had that heart attack years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's no big deal. I say, dying is highly overrated. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay, Carrie, well, what does God do with all of that? God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, His character, the truthfulness of His Word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason, and this testimony is abundant. That's from Steps to Christ, page 105, paragraph 2, and suggests we look at Genesis 127. Yeah. Genesis 127, so God created human beings, making them to be like himself. He created them male and female. So which one is more like God, the male or the female? Shall I start an argument? <laughs> 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 no, God was, and if you look at, if you know, in, in Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, words, and like, this is like in Spanish, they are male or female. The, every, every noun is male or female or there's some words that are neuter. But uh, in the Bible, there's a lot of names that of, God, of God that are female. Elohim, Elohim, I don't think. El Shaddai? I think maybe El Shaddai. I, yeah, I don't I remember. So. El Shaddai. Yeah. So what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Were we created, were we created in His physical image or His spiritual image? his intellectual image, his social image, or something else. Well, what image would you like to be created in? Jim? All heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God, and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. They were to live in close communion with heaven, receiving power from the source of all power. Upheld by God, they were to live sinless lives. Ellen White, Review and Herald, February 11, 1902. Yeah. Do we have any evidence that a tree of life and a tree of knowledge of good and evil may have existed in other worlds as well as this one? The Lord has given me a view of other worlds. Now this is, these are words from Ellen White. Ellen White, mm -hmm. Ellen White. Wings are given me, and the angel attended me from the city to a place where it was bright and glorious. The grass of the place was living green, and the birds there reveled. Warbled, uh, warbled. warbled. Uh, sweet song. The inhabitants of the place were of all sizes. They were noble, majestic, and lovely. They bore the expressed image of God, Jesus, and their countenances beamed with holy joy, expressive of the freedom and happiness of the place. I asked one of them why they were so much more lively than those on the earth. The reply was, we have lived 
in a strict obedience to the commandments of God and have not fallen by their disobedience like those on the earth. Then I saw two trees. One looked much like the tree of life in the city. The fruit of both looked beautiful, but of one they could not eat. They had power to eat both of both, but were forbidden to eat of one. Then my attending angel said to me, None in this place have tasted of the forbidden tree, but if they should eat, they would fall. Then I was taken to a world which had seven moons. There I saw good old Enoch, I like the way she puts it, yeah. good old Enoch, <laughs> who had been translated. On his right arm, he bore a glorious palm. And on, he, on its leaf was written victory, and around his head was a dazzling white wreath. The leaves of the wreath uh, and in the middle of each leaf was written purity. Around the wreath were stones of various colors and shone brighter than the stars. The cast a reflection upon the letters and magnified them. Let me interrupt for just a second. Imagine Ellen White being in that position. She saw this, and you know perfectly well she should have said what Paul said. I just, I, I can't describe what I saw. I, we don't, I don't have words even to describe what I saw here. But she's trying. She's trying, yes. On the back part of his head was a bow that confined the earth. The wreath. Wreath, wreath yeah, I guess. Bow, what is the wreath? Wreath. And upon the bow was written holiness. Above the wreath was a lovely crown that shone brighter than the sun. I asked him, this was the place he was taken from the earth. He said, it is not, the city is my home and I have come to visit this place. Wow. I moved around the place as if perfectly at home. I begged of my attending angel to let me remain in this place. I could not bear the thought of coming back to this dark and world again. Then the angel said, you must go back. And if you are faithful, you with the 144,000 shall have the privilege of visiting the worlds and viewing the handiwork of God. Ellen White, Early Writings, uh, page 39 and 40. Wow. Very interesting. Very Things interesting. that she saw in vision. Well, nothing else that we know about was created in God's image. So we are it. God even gave that incredible ability to procreate, allowing us to share the gift of life and thus create, in a sense, beings in our image. Aren't you glad that God did not give Satan the power to procreate? Can you imagine a universe or even a world full of little Satans? <laughs> Gary? Man was to bear God's image, both in outward resemblance and in character. So there gives you an idea. At least there's something specifically. Yes. Christ alone is the express image, that comes from Hebrews 1.3, mm -hmm. of the Father, but man was formed in the likeness of God. His nature was in harmony with the will of God. His mind was capable of comprehendi comprehending divine things. His affections were pure. His appetites and passions were under the control of reason. He was holy and happy in bearing the image of God and in perfect obedience to his will. This was from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 45, paragraph 2. Okay, so don't you wish we could just take a little tour now into the Garden of Eden? Yeah. See what it was like? Yeah. Now, there's going to be a garden up there in heaven. And we're all going to be allowed to access it. We can walk, walk around there among it, and I don't know if there will be a little monument where the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil used to be. <laughs> I don't know, you know, I, I think about these things. Well, the, Imagine, it does not hurt, but eyes have not seen, yeah. ears have yes. not heard. Gary, were you going to comment? I was, but I've lost it. Okay. I've lost it. I'll pick it up again. So now let's think about this. What is it that sets us apart? Can, what things can we name about human beings that make us in the image of God that supposedly nobody else has? 
Okay, every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the Creator, individuality, power to think and to do. The men and women, this power is developed, the men in whom this power is developed, and that would be women too, are the men who bear, the, who bear responsibilities, who are leaders in enterprise, who influence character. It is a work of true education to develop this power, to train the youth to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. Book of Education, pages 17 and 18. While other creatures here on this earth were given the unusual capacity to reproduce, which even Satan does not have, remember, none of them are created specifically in God's image with the power to think and to do. We, we love it when we even find a, a little hint of, of thinking going on in animals, pets, and monkeys, and things like this. We, oh, we, 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 we find that fascinating to watch and so forth, but they're not human. There's, there's no way they're human. What about elephants? They're pretty close. And elephants are pretty remarkable in many respects. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of making a single being, God could have done it this way, with the ability to divide or reproduce itself in some way, God created male and female so that we have to come together, preferably in an environment of love, in order to procreate. God intends for us to learn so many lessons about His challenge of dealing with us as His children by our dealing with our own children. And all of you who are parents know what, we're, what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, if you remember that story of the time when Jesus intentionally just took his disciples right through the middle of Samaria, going from Jerusalem up toward Nazareth. He sat down and he talked to that woman at the well. I've had the privilege, long ago it was possible, not, not, not at all easy now, to visit that well, Jacob's well, where, and I got, got to drink some of the water. But Jesus sat down there and remember that woman came and so forth, and in the process of his discovering or discussing with that woman, um, he said, God is spirit. What does that mean? Now, you know, we know that there's a lot of people who think that spirits are, you know, sort of ethereal beings or you can't see them. They just sort of, they're like clouds. They float around like that. Um, is that what God's trying to tell us? I don't think so. He, he is capable of handling one at a time or whole groups of people. Mm -hmm. uh, well, he's everywhere and yes. he's yeah. the creator and he can come as a beggar. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, we know that Jesus came, lived yes. his whole life. In fact, what do we know? He's adopted his, the human race to be, he, he, he's chosen right. to be a human forever. Forever. Yes. Yeah. Right. We know that the Bible emphasizes our intellectual and spiritual capacities, and so I'm sure that's a major part of the way in which we are like God. But God intends that we use these capacities to grow and become what? More like Him. Jim? God Himself gave Adam a companion. He provided and excuse me, provided and help meet for him, a helper corresponding to him one who was fitted to be his companion and who would, who could be one with him in love and sympathy. Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head or to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46. That's about as clear as you can make it, isn't it? V wonderful, wonderful paragraph idea. Okay, Charles? Genesis 1, 28, 29. God blessed them and said, Have many children so that your descendants would live all over the earth and bring it under their control. I am putting in your charge of fish, the birds, and all the wild animals. In charge, yes. but not to eat them. Then he told them, this is what you can eat. I have provided all kinds of grain and all kinds of fruit for you to eat. But, uh, you know, it, this also says seed, seed-bearing yes. plant. 
No vegetables. So this is a text I share with the Muslims and Hindus. Jains and, you know, the Lord, I, we would not, 75% of the diseases perhaps we would not have today had we been following this. Yes, that's right. And not even vegetables. Why weren't they given vegetables at after, that point? After the sin, why, why was it not given? It was given after sin. Right, right, after sin. It was not given at the beginning. Didn't need any. <laughs> couldn't have got vitamins. Well, this is the reason I give that I think is you have to kill a vegetable in order to eat it. Yeah. That's true, yeah, yeah. You don't have to kill fruits, you don't have to kill grains. You can you can take them off of the whatever they grow on and, and eat them and the, the grain can still be alive. It some grains die when you when you take the fruit off, but yeah. they wouldn't have to. Uh, yeah. Okay. And in new heaven and new earth we will be eating. Yep. So, getting back to what I when I lost it a little while ago, I often wonder when you think down through the ages of the people that could end up in heaven. There's got to be millions. Heaven cannot be a little place. No. And sort of going and living in one area, I I don't know. It's got to get there to figure it out, I guess. But it's got to be massive. I uh, I have been listening to some of the lesser known writings of Ellen White and things called manuscript releases. Um, I listen to them while I run in the morning. I, I've come across two very interesting things in this respect. One, Ellen White says, and, and you can think about it, it would have to be this way. If God says, you know, we, we just read it back here, um, your descendants will live all over the earth and bring it under their control. Okay, how large is the Garden of Eden? <laughs> huh? It didn't seem to be that big. The angels were looking after it. and they're... So the Garden of Eden was, God's plan was for it to expand to accommodate the number of people who lived there. But it did, it only did. And you think about it, I mean, how many trees were producing how many different kinds of fruit in the Garden of Eden? Mm. How much fruit do you need to feed two people? Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. don't know. And something else she said that I had never heard before, I just, was, wow, that's amazing. She said, up until the time of the flood, all the scientists and the people who were the philosophers and so forth were constantly trying to figure out a way that they get into the Garden of Eden and get to the Tree of Life. All those wicked people were trying to figure out how to get into the garden. They were pretty smart people. I think yeah. Ellen White, some were, the antediluvians were even trying to cross and gene playing with yeah. genetics. Da, 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 so. yeah. Well, how do you think man took charge of the fish living in those four rivers flowing out of the Garden of Eden? You fished. Do you, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did they... I mean, we have people with little fish in fish bowls. Yes. But, I mean, I don't think... Adam and Eve had any fish bowls. No, but what, they enjoyed it in the nature. Yeah. What was Adam and Eve's relationship with the birds and the wild animals? They could probably get them to come up. I mean, you can do that sure. here if you're careful, but I think that was a bit easier for them then. I just, go ahead, Charles. You give the little baby, it will see the cobra and want to go and play with because they were yeah. innocent, you know, yeah. and cobra might have something in mind. So yeah. in those days, cobra was not hurting. Yeah. Same, it's going to be again the same. Just thing. thinking about the wild animals, I just yeah. on the news before I came over here, they showed the quite remarkable pictures of a mountain lion wandering away in the hill not very far from here. Just walk up and down the road, looking around. People, I said to people, you know, better keep your small pets inside. Really? There was one made the paper, it might have been the same one. A woman was there, had a baby, and this thing was watching the movement of the baby. Really? Yeah. Wow, no, that's a different one than what I saw. Just, just recent. They're out there. Well, God was, cer it was certainly God's in intention for man to live in harmony with the other living creatures on the earth and to rule over them in a benign and wonderful way. Ab and Adam and Eve were to reproduce themselves. They and their children were to replenish the earth. They were given a specific diet to eat, and as were, as were the animals. In other words, God intended for them to have a wonderful life in obedience to His will. So here's another trivia question for you to think about. Not significant, but 
How many children do you think Eve had? Well, no, no three. But you probably one. Well, not they all had to have wives too. Yes. Right. They, well, they, in those days, there was nothing called incest. You see, well, today they would be in trouble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, she must have had hundreds of children. Yes. And God gave them that fabulous garden. They did not do anything to earn it. They were simply recipients of God's love and care. Well, what should we learn from those original events that may still apply to us in our, in our day? Surely we are still to live in obedient relationship with God. If we do, He will continue to bless us. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. He, that is God, said to them, You may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat of the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Now, we now know that the way that's worded, they began dying that day. They didn't die completely, but they began dying that day. Adam and Eve were provided with freedom and power to choose. Without it, they could not have the capacity to love. And if you don't understand that issue, um, you can go to our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Look under the first section there under uh, guides and you, there's a the whole handout explains how if you don't have love, it's impossible. I mean, if you don't have freedom, it's impossible to love. Of course, that meant that they had the capacity to sin and or to hate as well. Go back a little bit to yeah, okay. uh, number 24. We might be running the time. Right. But uh, just one sentence. If we do, he will continue to bless us. He blesses all his children, whether they are following him or not. It hurts In him. some respects, yes. Yeah, in some respects, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. That is yeah. correct. Yeah. Jim, everything? Everything preceding this in this chapter has paved the way for this climax, Genesis 2, 16, and 17. Yeah, those are the verses I just read. Right. The future of the race centers upon this single prohibition. Man is not to be confused by a multiplicity of issues. Only one divine ordinance must be kept in mind, by thus limiting the number of injunctions to one. Yahweh gives, in, gives tokens of his mercy besides, and, excuse me, besides to indicate that this one commandment is not grievous. The Lord sets it against the background of a broad permission. From every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. And it's interesting that uh, Satan, when he quoted that statement, he quoted in a way implying that you weren't supposed to eat of any of the trees. Right. So he twisted just enough. So, oh, God doesn't want you to eat of any of this fruit? And of course, well, how would you, if you were Eve, how would you naturally respond? Oh no, we can eat from all the trees. Well, then why not this tree? You, you can just see how that thing flowed. And what he was doing at that process was giving them some education. He yeah. says, listen. Yeah. And many times where you see the word obedience, it really means to, to listen. Uh, humble willingness to listen. Right. Holy angels often visited the garden and gave instruction to Adam and Eve concerning their employment and also taught them concerning the rebellion and fall of Satan. Angels warned them of Satan and cautioned them not to separate from each other in their employment, for they might be brought in contact with this fallen foe. The angels also enjoined upon them to follow closely the directions God had given them for in perfect obedience only were they safe. Then this fallen foe could have no power over them. Ellen White, Early Writings, page 147. And you know what uh, <clears throat> Martin Luther said about that? He said if Satan had tempted Adam, he would have said no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his estimation of women was... A, yes, unfortunately. And Jews. <clears throat> and Jews, Unfortunately, yes. yes. The tree of knowledge had been made a test of their obedience and their love of God. Lord had, the Lord had seen fit to lay upon them one prohibition as to the use of all that was in the garden. But if they should disregard his will in this particular, they would incur the guilt of transgression. 
Satan was not to follow them with continual temptations. He could have access to them only at the forbidden tree. Okay, and I want I want to I want that point to stick in people's minds very very clearly. We we, we sort of in the back of our mind, oh yeah, it's this tree, that's what there. But we usually say, well, the tree was put there to tempt Adam and Eve. Go ahead. Should they attempt to investigate its nature, they would be exposed to his wiles. They were admonished to give careful heed to the warning which God had sent them and to be content with the instruction which he had seen fit to get, seen fit to impart. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophet, page 53. But if you based upon that passage there, it was for their protection. Yep. Satan couldn't chase them all over the, uh, the, exactly. the, the garden. He was confined to that place. However, it gave them the opportunity to listen yeah. to both sides of the stories. Well, when Adam and Eve were created, <clears throat> Satan and his evil angels immediately demanded access to them. And God, being the fair individual that he is, allowed Satan to have access to them. However, only at that one tree did he have access. He was not allowed to follow them around the garden. We just read that. Uh, and wherever they went. So the tree, instead of being a temptation, was intended to be a protection. Mm. Not a temptation, a protection. Adam and Eve had been warned. They knew that their lives were totally dependent upon God himself. They could continue to live forever in that garden if they would remain faithful to their loving Heavenly Father. But they had to use their freedom to choose to accept his will. While they did not understand all the implications at that time, we know that the knowledge of evil that they were offered led to alienation, loneliness, frustration, and finally, death. So what do you think? Do we face any tests like the, God knowledge of tree of, the tree of knowledge of good and evil in our day? Oh, yes. Wherever you look, just about. Yeah. You know what? This devil's wares, you don't go into his store. Yeah. Living in an evil world as we do, we tend to trust people with no, uh, we know, and just instinctively distrust those whom we do not know. Eve had been warned repeatedly about Satan. If Satan had appeared as an angel, she would have run. And Ellen White says that specifically. So Satan used a surrogate, the serpent or snake in the tree, who appeared to be able to talk. I, um, you know how people see movies now and the people have known how to make movies and they, they see very, they seem very realistic and sometimes they make us rejoice and make us happy and sometimes they make us really sad. Someday we're going to see in 3D living color this whole story. How are we going to respond when, watch, when we see Eve go, don't do this, don't do this. <laughs> Try to imagine it. Uh, Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake, well, Satan got into the snake. So yeah. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat the fruit of this tree in the garden? Now I want to, I want to notice, notice there, the, the quote we looked at just above said, in God's word, you could eat from every tree except this one. Now look at how Satan words it. Did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? <laughs> so what's, what's he saying? You mean you can't eat, look at all these beautiful trees with all this stuff. You can't eat any of those? Well, and of course, you know, what would you say? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, we can eat them. Well, but why not this why one? Not you, know? this one? you can just see how the logic is spilling out here. Go ahead. We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. The serpent replied, that's not true. You will not die. And unfortunately, Christians believe that you yeah. will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat, if you will be, if you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. This is Satan still speaking. Yeah. 
Roman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruits fruit would be to eat. How, how did she know that? Well, she saw him eating. Yeah, I suppose she saw she saw the serpent eating and he yeah. could talk. I and mean, then the oh, saliva wow. started to flow. Yeah, and who knows? This is something you know. This is something. Hey, if he can eat and he is not yeah. dying, maybe I should give this a try. Yeah. And she thought how wonderful it would be to become wise. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. And she gave some to her husband and all who also ate. Wow. Deplorable as was Eve's transgression and fraught as it was with the potential all for the human family. Her choice did not necessarily involve the race of the penalty for the transgression. It was the deliberate choice of Adam. Hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's too bad. You have to choose between God and your wife. That's a tough one. <clears throat> the full understanding of the expressed commander, command of God's, God rather than her, hers that made sin and death the inevitable lot of mankind. He was deceived. Adam was not. This article on Genesis 3.16, 6, Francis D. Nichol, SDA Bible Commentary. Yeah. We have to admit now, I, I'm going to be a little, I'm going to take the men's side a little bit. We must admit, of course, that Eve became the temptress. So, yeah, she was deceived, but now she goes, she knows what she's doing, and she's tempting him. Thus, that special relationship God had with the pair was broken. Carrie? Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. As soon as they had eaten it, they were given understanding and realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. In brackets it says, how did they do that? They got out the sewing machine and zipped up. <laughs> God created them as brilliant beings. They, might, they obviously figured it out some way. Yeah. But they went to the palm tree, got some of the branches, and there is a spine there. I, I was just thinking about yeah. that. Maybe that's what they did. So Maybe. They took some pines and they put it together. That evening they heard the Lord God walking in the garden, and they hid from him among the trees. But the Lord God called out to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid and I hid from you because I was naked. That's from the Good News Bible. And as sad well, as this whole story is, God wow. almost immediately gave them a glimmer of hope. Yeah. And the glimmer of hope is Genesis 3.15. Mm -hmm. I will make you, he's now speaking to the snake, I will make you, the snake, and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head and you will bite her offspring's heel. And I had a chance to do that just this last week. <laughs> I was cleaning outside in the porch, cement porch right outside our kitchen dining room area. And I was just, and, and here was something that looked, looked like a colorful lid to the top of a, of a jar of some kind. Said, what in the world is that thing? I gave it a kick and it was a rattlesnake. Yeah. I mean, it was a small one, so it was, the whole thing wrapped up was about, you know, about that size. I mean, and I, uh, I hated him. I dispatched him. You did Genesis 3.15. I did Genesis 3.15. Yeah. yeah. Oh, one quick, uh, hopefully we can do this very quickly. It says, your offspring, but then it says, you will crush his hill. Yeah. You have any comment on that one? Yes, if we could read Hebrew, it would all be very easy. Yeah, please. This well, I I can't no, really read know, Hebrew. No, no, I mean go ahead. But it okay. says you know he's talking about you as a group first of all, and the first part of it, all of you will hate the snake oh. and so forth, and the second half is talking about the individual who is going to have his <laughs> his his this heel. Satan himself. Yes. But he it would be Satan himself against Christ himself. Right. Yep. Thank you. Adam and Eve already knew that the cosmic conflict was underway, and God had promised that ultimately his side would what? Win. Win. One important thing to notice in this whole story is that no sooner had man committed that first sin than God 
came searching for him. God is always looking for us. And it is important for us to notice that the Bible is full of calls for us to come back to him. See, for example, and there's a bunch of verses there, Psalm 95, Isaiah 55, Luke 15, Luke 19, and I like especially Revelation 22, 17, the very end, the last words, God says, just come, just come. Mm. Unfortunately, many people who study this tragic story do not realize how much was involved. And now I'd like to take us into the bigger picture here, what we sometimes call the larger view. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely to the that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion, he said, now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Now what's missing there? The word men in, in the King James, which is in italics, and many other translations put the word men. I think the good news says everyone. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, men is not in the, in the Greek. It's not there in draw the Greek. all unto me. Or, yep. uh, so, and so Ellen White knew that. So look what she says. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man will not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe. It would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the result of sin. Patriarchs and Prophets 68. So the entire universe is involved in the great controversy. And the solution cannot come until everyone in the universe is understood and agrees that one, God was not at fault. Two, he has done everything possible to redeem the situation. Three, his way of handling, handling the rebellion is the best and only way to deal with the conflict. His government by love is the only way in which a universe can survive. And what should be our response? We are expected to extend this invitation to others after we ourselves respond. And that's that same verse, Revelation 22, 17. He says, come, and then what are you supposed to do? Let us reason together. Let us reason together, but in Revelation 22, come and then tell everybody else to come. We are supposed to be calling others, come, come, come. One of the very interesting things that we observe on national news from time to time, and I have to smile every time I hear this happening, is that despite the fact that in general, on the news ca channels, they give tacit agreement to the idea that we have evolved from some lower forms of life where when a disaster comes, they immediately ask us to pray. <laughs> so now I ask you, if we are in need of help in a disaster and if we, and if we believe in revolution, evolution, should we pray to the presumed first cell ancestor of our mankind? Oh, I can just barely see you under the microscope, but please save us, right? <laughs> I mean, how uh, people must think that sounds so foolish. Yeah. Anyway, creatures made in the image of God are intended to live in relationships. Parents with children, friends with friends, husbands with wives, employees, employees. Try to imagine it would be like to live in heaven where everyone is loving and kind. Clearly, God intended for human beings to live in a relationship with him throughout eternity. But Eve was trapped by her curiosity. Curiosity can be a diabolical trap when people try to investigate things that God has not revealed. See, for example, Deuteronomy 29, 29. In modern times, human beings have learned how to release a tiny, tiny fraction of the energy contained in matter to produce various kinds of atomic weapons which have massive destructive potential. The famous equation, E equals mc squared, tells us about that relationship. But God has the ability to take some of his divine energy and condense it into matter. He can make that E equals mc squared equation go backwards. 
And how is that described, Jim? Absolute or origination, that is, a beginning and bringing out of nothing ex nihilo, and not any mere fashioning of some pre-existent matter or pre-matter. Okay. Harold Kuhn, God makes in the living God reading in Christian theology. Okay, so in other words, God didn't start out with something that someone else gave him to work with. He makes things out of nothing except energy. So what are some of the other ideas about origins? Well, spiritualists teach that man is a creature of progression. Ellen White talks about that in Great Controversy 554. And then there's social Darwinism. It lays the groundwork for genetics, geneticists and biologists under the cloak of science, notice the cloak of science, to categorize human beings in a way as to support racial superiority, an idea brought to its apogee in Nazi Germany under the book Sabbath Roots, The African Connection. God tells us that we were made in His likeness and in His image. Charles, can you finish up for us? Like God, they had the power of choice, the freedom to think and act according to their moral imperatives. Thus they were free to love and obey or to distract and distrust and disobey. Seventh Adventists believe and yeah, the exposition of the book that talks belief. about all the things we, we believe in. God created man for his own glory that after test and trial the human family might become one with the heavenly family. What was God's plan? To repopulate. For us to become a part of the heavenly family. It was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family if they would show themselves obedient to his every word. And again, that's Ellen White's comments, ST Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1082. In any case, we know what happened. The results were tragic. They both ate, and the great wisdom they obtained was a knowledge of sin and a sense of guilt. The covering of light about them soon disappeared under a sense of guilt and loss of their divine covering, a shivering seized them. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 40. So what change needs to take place in us to get us back on track? I see we're running out of time. The change which must come to the natural inherited and cultivated tendencies of the human heart is that change of which Christ, Jesus spoke when he said in Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we're going to have to stop there. If you want to get the rest, you can go to our website. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father. What a sad story. What a marvelous beginning, but a sad ending. And we are so thankful for the additional insights that we have been given from Ellen White. We thank you for this opportunity to talk about all these issues and to share with others who might be listening in. Bless each one who hears it, that they may be enlightened in some way or other and be drawn nearer to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.